2 Peter chapter number 1. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's an important verse because it sets the stage for us. First of all, he announces who he is. The writer, the author here is Peter. Peter is an amazing character. We could go back into the Gospels and we learn that Peter was the guy who in the beginning of his relationship with God, uh, walking with and living with Jesus Christ as one of the disciples, was the guy who would jump up on the table, look around and say, follow me, I know where we're going even when he'd never had a clue where they were going. He was the one who told Jesus that he would never leave him, and yet he is the one who notoriously, famously denied Christ. Peter was a guy who was so full of himself until he got knocked down and realized that what he needed was less of himself and more of Jesus, which makes, makes this such a significant passage of Scripture. He comes to this, and he begins to explain what God has done for us. But he explains this in the context of believers. He says, to those that have obtained like precious faith, verse number two, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Another question I want you just to throw in the back of your mind. You don't have to answer it. But how many of you would acknowledge that God tells us he gives peace and yet you live so much of your life feeling as though you don't have peace. Peter says, grace and peace be multiplied. Look at verse number three. According as his divine power <laughs> hath given unto us, what's the next word? All? Not some. According as his divine power has given us what? All, all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us the exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We're going to get into verse number five in just a minute, but in these first couple of verses, we see God's part in all of this. Listen to me, if you are like me at all, you have moments in your parenting and moments in your career and moments as you look at the world falling apart around you and moments when you look at your bank statement where you say something like, God, if you would just give me what I need to move forward, I could do it. God, if you would answer my prayer the way I want the prayer answered, I could do it. And God, if you would do whatever your thing is, then God, I could be successful in this life. It's as if we're blaming God for those areas of struggle, blaming God for those shortcomings in our own lives. And the Bible here says, Peter says, look, I once was like you. I once believed I had it all figured out. But what I've learned over the course of my life and what I've learned over time is that through Jesus Christ, having a relationship with God, indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, I have everything I need. Let's start here. This is the foundation. Listen, if you are a believer today, set aside how you feel. Set aside what you think. Set aside what other people are telling you. Know from the Word of God that you have everything you need to accomplish everything that God wants to accomplish through you. Do we believe the Bible? then even when we don't feel like it, even when it doesn't make sense, even when we have more questions than answers, we must accept the truth that because of Jesus Christ and his divine power, we have everything we need to live the life that he's called us to live. Verse number four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. What a truth that we have been given by God great and precious promises. We see promises like salvation, Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a precious promise that whosoever, anyone who will come to the place of understanding, they cannot on their own have a relationship with God. Sin has broken that relationship and yet Jesus Christ, because God, so to speak, looked over the banister rail of heaven, looked at his creation and said, they need me. He sent his son Jesus to die in our place on the cross, but because he's God, 
God. When he died, he took sin to hell with him. The grave was defeated. Death was defeated because he is God, and he rose three days later. What a promise. That's just the beginning. Beyond that, we can have a relationship with God. It makes my heart sad when I hear people say, I believe I can have my sins forgiven, but I cannot have a relationship with God. Second Chronicles, going back to the Old Testament, chapter 15 and verse 2, the Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. We could go through hundreds of verses throughout Scripture helping us to understand that we can have an active relationship with God. I know people push, push back on this idea of a personal Savior, a personal God. I understand the pushback, but here's the truth. God the Father wants to have a personal relationship with you and with me. If we fail to have that relationship, it's not God's fault. One of the precious promises is that God desires to, and he demonstrated through the death of his son, desires to have a relationship with us. A precious promise next of peace. There's so little peace in our world. You read the news any day, <laughs> any day, go later. Peace is not something anyone's talking about. It used to be that we at least pretended we were trying to get to a point of peace. No one's even pretending anymore. We've accepted that conflict and brokenness and hurt is just a part of life. And yet a precious promise from our Savior Jesus is peace. Psalm 29 and verse 11, the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. The promise of wisdom. James chapter 1 and verse 5 talks about wisdom, but Proverbs chapter 2, 6, I love the way this is said, for the Lord giveth wisdom, real simple. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. We talk about the, the gift of grace, James chapter 4 and verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The gift of comfort, Isaiah 51 and verse 12, I, even I, am he that comforteth you. And the gift of hope, Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Hear that rain? That's good right there. <laughs> That's how you know you're alive. It's raining outside and you're in here. So many wonderful, precious promises given to us by God. And I hope that you'll hang on to those. I hope that you realize those were given to you. And yet I wonder... How many of you could acknowledge that those were given to us by God, that they are indeed <laughs> taught to us in Scripture? But if we were honest, we sometimes wonder where they are. We sincerely believe what was just said because the Word of God undergirds all that was said, these precious promises. We know they were given to us by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. We have hope and we have peace and we have wisdom. We certainly have salvation. We can have a relationship with God. But if we take inventory of our life, we have to say, I can acknowledge that those things are so, but I wonder where they are. Where's the peace? Where's the comfort? Where's the hope? Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 says, God is not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Romans 4.21, and being fully persuaded that he had promised, that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. You can say, I get it. I can acknowledge it, I believe it, but where is it? It is one thing for something to be true. It is another thing entirely to allow that truth to affect our lives. Guys, it is one thing for the Bible to be true. It's one thing to acknowledge that the Bible is true. It is another thing entirely to allow the truth of the Bible to impact our lives. I was listening to a podcast this week. 
And I like interview podcasts, and I'm just interested in just different topics. And uh, a writer was being interviewed. He had written a lot of books and writes a lot of stuff. And he's being interviewed, and the interviewer asked him about his, how do you get into this? You know, that's the first question you always ask. How did you get into this? He goes like, well, funny, funny story. He said, most people don't know this, but I was actually a youth pastor out of high school. I started working at my church, and I was a youth pastor. And then I decided I didn't believe it anymore, and that put me on this path to becoming an author. And he just kind of passed over it, and the interviewer was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Let's go back to that youth pastor thing. And this wasn't a Christian podcast. This wasn't a Christian doing the interviewing. He said, tell me about that. He said, well, I was raised in a Christian home. I made a profession of faith when I was young. My parents were Christians. As I grew up in high school, and I went to camp, and I went to other things. Uh, I started to believe that the most important message I could communicate was the message of God and Jesus and faith. So I became a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for several years. I was married. My wife was in the ministry with me, and I woke up one day and realized I didn't believe any of this. So often right now, we're hearing stories of people that say they lost their faith. They've walked away from the faith. If you're paying attention, you may have heard the phrase deconstruction. People talking about deconstructing their faith as though there's something wrong with faith. It's one thing for something to be true. It's another thing entirely for that truth to impact your life. It's possible for you to come to a place where you realize something is true. And because you don't allow that truth to impact your life, you get down the road a little ways and you go, you know what? I don't really believe that anymore. The truth has not changed. God has not changed. You have changed. I want you to look at another verse with me quickly and then we're going to get to what we're told to add. Look at verse number 9. But he that lacketh these things, the things that we're going to talk about in just a second, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And some of the most damning words in all of the Bible, this next phrase, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That does not say, and came to the realization that they were not purged by their old sins, uh, from their old sins. Uh, that passage, or the, those, that verse does not say uh, that they came to the place where they saw things clearly. What that verse tells us is that if you don't do your part after God does his part, the truth remains, but you become blind. You get to a place where you're so clouded in your thinking that even though the truth is true, it no longer has an impact on your life. This next point, point number two, if you are a parent, you need to spend a lot of time looking at this when you get home, breaking it down, <laughs> and teaching it to your kids. Do you want kids that will continue to go to church when they get to decide whether or not they go to church? We need to work through point number two. Do you want to have kids that won't have a crisis of faith when they realize just how difficult the world is? You need to spend some time parked on point number two. Do you want to be the kind of person that understands the truth is true and then allows it to impact your life? Let's begin reading together in verse number five. We saw God's part. Let's look at our part together. He said, and beside this, I like Peter because Peter's a guy I get. <laughs> I understand him. And when you read what he writes, there's nothing flashy here. He said, okay, here's God's part. He did all this stuff. So beside that, add, this is something you need to do, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren 
nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at these things in a minute, but he says, you need to do, then he gives us a list. One more aside. Here it is. In a church, when people talk about lists, do's and don'ts, God says you need to do some stuff. Those that don't want to do what God says will start hurling accusations. <laughs> they like to say things like, well, you are being a legalist. Or, that's spiritual abuse to say that I have to do some things. Or, you don't understand grace. This is a note, this is an aside, because I don't want you to get hung up on this. Those people don't know what they're talking about. Legalism is adding works to the gospel. Legalism is not following what the Bible says. <laughs> These verses that we're looking at here, verse 5 and down, that give us a list, this has nothing to do with salvation. This has nothing to do with how much God loves you. God could not love you more, regardless of what you do. It, it, Peter says, beside this, Peter says, God has already done this. It's already there. Truth is truth. He's made this available to you. You have everything you need for your life. And this list has nothing to do with God doing his part. This is not to garner favor. It's not legalism to say the Bible says, and I need to do. Spiritual abuse is a real thing. Spiritual abuse is me using God and the Bible to get you to do what I want you to do. Churches do that. People do that. I know it's real. But listen to me. Someone standing here and saying, and we've got a pastor who preaches the Bible every week. I'm so thankful for our pastor. <laughs> I'm in a lot of churches. I travel a lot. There are a lot of good men who preach. But it's not always entirely from the Bible. <laughs> they say good stuff. Our pastor constantly grounding us in the Word of God. Why? Because saying, thus saith the Lord, is not spiritual abuse. It's loving. It's shepherding. It's pastoring. Now, if we use the Bible, and we use God, and we use church, and we use feeling and emotion and whatever to get you to do what we want you to do, that's a different thing entirely. But simply saying this is what God said is the encouragement that's supposed to be found as we preach and teach his word. People say you don't understand grace. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. You cannot earn it. You cannot deserve it. You won't. <laughs> this has nothing to do with earning or deserving God's love or grace. It's about entering into a relationship where that grace has an impact on your daily lives. He lists some things. We don't have a lot of time. You're going to have to go back and look at these. I'll give you verses you can consider with them. The first one is virtue. What does virtue mean? It means moral excellence or purity. That's where people get stopped right there. <laughs> You know, I don't want to do this thing, this list thing, you're a legalist, you're this, you're that, you're whatever, because the first one is moral excellence and purity. Listen, your rejection of the Word of God that tells us that we are to live holy lives is not the same thing as a crisis of faith. It's a rebellion against God. They're not the same thing. And Peter is saying, look, if you want to enter into what God has provided for you, you need to focus in the right place. Stop looking at all this stuff out here and instead strive to be pure, strive to be virtuous, strive to be morally excellent. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Peter starts off by saying you need to focus on virtue, being morally excellent. He talks next about knowledge. That is knowing or understanding God and his truth. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to know God and know what God wants us to do. We learn that by studying his word. There is knowledge. And Peter says, look, learn of God, know God, know what God wants you to do. Read his word and understand his word. Knowledge, it is understanding God and his truth. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. He moves on to this next one, temperance. We don't like this one. This is self-control. 
You say, God, if you would just show me what you want me to do, and God says, all right, I want you to live a pure life, I want you to read the Bible, and I want you to exhibit some self-control. We say, yeah, that's a little too hard. (laughs) Mostly I was talking about what job you want me to have when I said I want you to show me your will. (laughs) Peter says focus in the right place. Be a person who is under control. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, all things are lawful unto me, Paul said, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. As Paul teaches us, he, he, he explains, there are more important things than what I want. The more important thing is doing what God wants. He goes on, he talks about patience. What is patience? Cheerful endurance. I love that definition. Cheerful endurance. We live at a moment in time where there needs to be some cheerful endurance. You know what we do? We have trials, difficulties come into our life, and we rail against those things. The Holy Spirit of God does not have a voice in our lives. We don't experience peace or hope or comfort because we have moved beyond an understanding of cheerful endurance, 2 Timothy 4, 6, for I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Cheerful endurance doesn't mean you have to be happy all of the time, but it acknowledges that you're not God. <laughs> He talks next about godliness. It's just piety. Having a God-word attitude, 1 Timothy 4, 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of all that which is to come. Godliness, a God-word attitude. What would God have me to do? Brotherly kindness. This list is incredible. It hits everything, brotherly kindness. It is love for the brethren, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. We need each other. And even in this list that says you need to be partakers of what God has already provided, one of the things on the list is you need to be together. You need other people in your life. You need to be encouraged. You need to go to a small group. It's in there. Read it. You need to sign up for one. <laughs> They're starting in like two weeks, so sign up for one. Seriously, sign up for one. Why do we do that? Well, because we need to focus in the right place. Because God has given us everything we need, and we need people around us to encourage us to do what God has called us to do. He ends with charity, agape, selfless love, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, it's not puffed up, it does not behave itself unseemly, it seeketh not her own, it is not easily provoked, it thinketh no evil. All of these could be summed up in one phrase, you need to focus on living life for others. We're so consumed with ourselves that we never enjoy what God has provided to us. When we struggle to allow the promises of God to take hold and impact our lives, perhaps it's because we're focusing on what we want God to do instead of on what God has already done. You read these verses again. Verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. What a verse. Verse 10, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That means take hold of what God has set in front of you. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall doesn't say you'll never have a trial or a tribulation or a difficulty or an obstacle or an enemy. He says, look, if you do these things, you're focused in the right place, then the truth will impact your life, and regardless of what happens in the world, you will continue moving forward for the glory of God in His created purpose for you. What a truth. We come finally to the starting point. This is the last part of this passage. It's actually found in the beginning. Where does all of this start? Where does it begin? Uh, Where does it begin? 
verse number 5. And beside this, remember in verse number 1, he acknowledged these are Christian people he's talking to. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. The starting point of the Christian life is faith. The starting point of the mature, sanctified, pursuing God Christian life is faith. We build on a foundation of faith. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Romans 10, 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him should not be ashamed. Whosoever, therefore, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hebrews eleven six. 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him. Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. John sixteen thirteen. How be it then he, the Spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The starting point is faith. Confidence in God. Confidence that he is God, he is sovereign, he knows. I can trust him even when I don't understand. That begins with a relationship through Jesus Christ, putting my confidence, my hope, my eternal uh, value in Jesus Christ and what he did for me on the cross. It's not about me, it's about him. My confidence is in Him. It's not about me. And then living life, understanding whatever is around the next corner, whatever is over the next hill, whatever is down the road, I can trust Him. And hanging on to those divine promises that He has given to us to do all that He's created us to do, we focus where He's called us to focus. In an insane world, with so much to pull our focus away from a God that loves us, saves us, and equips us with his precious promises, the only way to keep moving forward is to focus on those things that will keep us focused on him. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. We've read this, I think, three times already. For if these things be in you and abound... Christian life. It's not casual. It's not something that just happens on Sunday morning. What do you say? Give diligence to add. And if these things be in you and abound, what's going to happen? You won't be barren. You won't be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, because of that, Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. I'm so grateful for the precious promises of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that along with those precious promises comes another promise. If you'll hang on to those, you have everything you need to live the life you were created to live. And in spite of what's happening in the world, you'll never fall. But to get from truth being truth to truth impacting your life, you need to focus in the right place. Add to your faith. What about you this morning? Listen, I know the world is a tough place. I know there is an active rebellion against God that seeks to shake people of faith from the foundation of faith. I know more now than I ever have that there are real people in this world who are doing everything they can to destroy my kids' faith so that the generation coming up behind me doesn't come to a building like this and doesn't live out what we say we believe. But the truth of God's word is that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The world, the flesh, the devil <laughs> cannot destroy you unless you say, I'm not going to 
put my hands around the precious promises of God that give me everything I need to do everything that God wants to accomplish through me. Will you add to your faith? Because if you will, (laughs) you will never be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, God. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to be in this place. Thank you for what you're doing here, God. Uh, What an amazing honor it is to be in a church like this. I thank you for a church that values your word, a pastor that preaches and teaches the Bible every single week. I thank you for a church family that has collectively said, we we know what's happening in the world, (laughs) but we're just going to move forward for the glory of God. We're going to build buildings and add stuff and move from one place to the next and be inconvenienced and do whatever we have to do because really it's not about us. It's about having an opportunity to invite our community to a place where they can hear the gospel message proclaimed. God, I thank you for everything that's happening here. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that you give us everything we need to accomplish everything you want to do through us. Father, I pray that instead of focusing on what we don't have, what we don't know, what we don't understand, that we would be people who would focus on living lives of virtue and knowledge and wisdom and purity. And God, that we would be around one another, a love for the brother and a connection to other people. God, that we would be patient, trusting you, our eyes ever on you, that we'd be committed to godliness, that is having a God-word attitude, asking the question again and again, what would God have me to do? Father, we know that you have specific callings on each one of our lives. We thank you for that. Give us the patience, the cheerful endurance to continue moving forward in what we do know and allowing you to reveal the other elements of your will and desire for our lives as you see fit, when you see fit. God, I pray for every family here today. I know, I understand. As a, as a parent, God, I, I, it's heavy on my heart, and I'm sure it is for a lot of folks here. The world that we live in is not friendly to our children growing up and continuing to serve you and live for you. God, I pray that we as parents would take the responsibility seriously to live in that relationship with you, to do what you have commanded us to do, and then to teach that to our children. To encourage them and to strengthen them. This is not about perfect parenting or or any of the rest of it, the stuff we get hung up on. It's about going and saying, this is what God says and this is what we need to do. God's given us everything we need. Uh, Son, daughter, God's given you everything you need to be what he created you to be, but you need to focus in the right place. God, I pray that you would please, in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, take us from acknowledging that something is true to allowing it to work in our daily lives beginning right now. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you can and do and will keep your word. Please work in our hearts and work in our lives. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.